Right, let's uh, pick up where we left off. Um, we had a threefold structure of experience from Heidegger, the awareness of the past, the plane of imminence where action occurs and our, uh, our kind of um, projecting into the future of our present actions. Then we talked about a psychological conflict between that experience and its reality. That's a very broad thing to say, for sure. Um, we can talk about it in the psychological tradition as a kind of distortion of reality or um, an alienation of ourselves from reality, um, wish fulfillment, various ways to try and uh, assimilate um, oneness with the social reality. And then we also talked about the conflicts between what I call tautological objects. So we talked about the use of various signs um, and uh, architecture, which has an initial use or a master signifier, um, but then can also reach out into a strange kind of a labyrinth of other uses some which we're happy about and perhaps some which we aren't. Um, and I think that um, conflict of meaning is, is use which is productive, is the production of differences, um, is of course, I think one can see that stemming from a dialectical tradition in Hegel, um, and then turning that over with Marx. But I would like to have a few, make a few points about at least the Marxist dialect, we have a kind of top bottom, maybe this is a kind of uh, controversial way of looking at it, a uh, top bottom model of dialectics with Marx, and the top in a sense being history. Um, history is the cause through all these historical conflicts um, of material needs and necessities, whether met or not met, uh, they determine in a sense the present uh, reality. And I think this is problematic in a lot of ways. Um, firstly, I don't think this is the case, basically. I think it's wrong. I think when we act on the plane of imminence in a Deleuzean sense, we're making a decision over and over again. We're making a decision whether we wish to choose, if we, we wish to affirm the current state of play or not. Now, I'm not trying to say that we uh, have all this, have as much agency as it's denoted there, but but when we interact with the present, there has to be a sense of affirming the equipment around us in order to do that. And I think this is quite obvious in simply critical theory or research. In the present, you make a decision to plug into or to assimilate let's say, older texts. But the use of bringing them into present is going to change them somewhat. Um, so the agency becomes the present situation, not um, the conditioning of past onto the subject. It's the subject which, in a sense, reactivates older concepts, decides if we should take up that idea or not that idea, you know? And I see them as these kind of sigils, conceptual sigils, whether it's simply picking up a cup of, and obeying that type of interaction or um, having a certain prejudice or value. We're kind of perpetually reactivating sigils. Sigils would simply be concepts that we've already made that are somehow established can somehow be communicated in a more general sense. So I don't want to think of us as um, we may be victims of thought but we're not victims of history in that sense, um, not simply products of history. Right so that's one point. Now let's go more into this idea of the tautological realm so we could say from the tautology 
is when we the meaning when we get the meaning is used right of an object. That is, Sartre said that human beings are the only things in the world that have existence which precedes essence. So we exist in the world without knowing what for what to do. And we have to kind of we have a project of commitment uh, or authenticity in order to find out that essence. But if we look everywhere everywhere else, we've already imbued a concept in it. Everything has a concept. Um, and they are tautological because the ob object and concept mesh into each other to such a point, for, for pragmatism's sake, if we start looking at a shoe and think beyond putting on our feet, um, then <laughs> we're out of pragmatism and we're into kind of studying. It kind of is the Heideggerian idea that it becomes a broken tool and, and it, it's brought into consciousness and it's going to start assimilating loads of different things when we study it like that. So it's generally accepted that we're trying to delimit the amount of uses for something and to create a master use for everything. So society operates um, quite smoothly. Um, but the problem with that is, and this doesn't have to be some kind of strange outside um, interacting with the human or to human world. It could simply be that human beings appropriate and reappropriate uses we can kind of deconstruct objects down to having many uses i mean the history of art at least in modernity is a kind of it's a kind of unstripping of the, the the initial tautology of the object and concept and reappropriating it whether it's in a different context found objects redefining the very use of the object basically in art that's very exciting for assimilation but in kind of capitalist realism, um, it's not that exciting. Um, the object is the concept and the concept, um, the concept operates on a system of use or system of value exchange, sometimes mainly arbitrary. Um, so then we can start seeing the world in this sense of a kind of process philosophy of objects with meanings attached to them, conceptual meanings that we put them there in the first place that reflect their use to such an extent that we actually become oriented by these uses. This is the herd mentality in Nietzsche. This is this is the familiar in Hegel, which basically means that the unemployment of thought. We're so used to things telling us what they are, that we can just somnambulistically move around and exist in that way. Um, and then if we want to start talking a bit more philosophically and ontologically about that capitalist realism assimilation that we're in, um, we could start also seeing the subject as a tautology itself. Not only is the object a meshing of the concept with itself, um, the subject is seen as a certain thing with a certain use. And again, this has different layers to it. It could simply be the sense that we assign onto ourselves or the unnameable we, perhaps, the species being, assigns to itself a use, for example, reproduction, um, safety of oneself, uh, family, um, achieving some monetary status, social status, etc., etc. If we don't if, presume those tautologies in us, then uh, capitalism gets into all, all sorts of difficulties. It wants us to think that we're another object among objects being arbitrarily circulated. Um, there are also other sly tautologies that are, that are kind of uh, assimilated. For example, the idea of um, individuality has become quite popular of recent, that we have an idea of being individual, but it's actually a fake one, which allows us to try to buy, buy certain clothes, which are maybe different, act in a certain way. Um, so the subject is also a tautology, 
for those reasons. Um, but let's go way back. Instead of thinking about the way that our contemporary culture wants to wants to see ourselves as, let's say, for example, we can agree with those. We can agree with the structuralist uh, and anything afterwards, really, um, idea of the self as a su as a subject, as also a construct, a conceptual category, contingent category, not innate, um, created at a certain time um, for a certain use within the system. Um, so, for example, the idea of a subject having agency, um, causing one's own thoughts, having morality, being committed to a truth, things like this. These can easily be knocked, and Nietzsche is a good example of someone who, de, who kind of uh, knocks down with his hammer the, the initial, the early modern history um, uh, of the philosophical subject, i.e. Descartes onwards. Um, and in fact, Descartes, in a sense, with his radical doubt, is actually, even though he's instantiating the subject, one can read it in, the, in a different sense, which is he is employing the, the scepticism of, of his own neurotic thought, breaking away at all these earlier concepts. He's making a decision, decision in the present to be sceptical of all that has gone before him. Um, and who knows that the devil of doubt in his meditations maybe wins. He, you know, he may think that he's got, got to the other side and knows that I think therefore I am, but I think therefore I am could also be an assumption. He's maybe assimilated by the idea that that's the tautology of a subject. That was a tricky sentence. Um, what else do I want to talk about? So, the tautological sphere of a subject and the tautological sphere of the objects in everyday existence which imply the same concept. There's a kind of contract, a philosophical or social contract. When I see a cup, when I see the objects in every day, they somehow imply that I am a subject of the Cartesian idea. There is a handle on the cup uh, which suggests I have agency to pick it up. It's an intentional object, yeah? So who knows that if we rid ourselves, if, if, if it's possible, of the idea of a, of, a, of a Cartesian subject, the objects in the world would still imply the shadow of it somehow. It would still probably resuscitate the subject back because its equipment is made in that way, um, which is really interesting, I think. So I kind of want to come back to Hegel because I criticise the Marxist dialectic and I think the Hegelian one isn't as limiting at all because with Hegel you don't simply have a history of concepts in which we are found in the world and which we simply build upon. For Hegel there is a moment of thinking in the present which attempts to, which one can employ to attempt to transcend the, that history. So for example, when Hegel talks about the familiar, the familiar is the unemployment of thought because who thinks the familiar one simply is in it. Um, then he suggests there is a possibility of transcending even the coordinates of subject and object through channeling the absolute idea, through realising the flux that these coordinates only momentarily kind of um, position us in, in, in relation to something. Um, so I agree with Hegel in this sense that there is an action in the present that is possible, the reassimilation of things. And I agree with Hegel that the embeddedness of a subject is not simply in material processes, which, which is popular in this day and age of involving us in 
material processes, affectivity, um, subconscious, unconscious. Um, even you could say like capitalism has become a condition for a condition for thinking, a, a, a thinking subject. I think really we need to be talking about concepts instead, not floating around perfect ideas, just simply that we register things through the tautology that I talked about. We register things through an understanding and understanding is become so tacit, so embedded, so familiar um, that we act on those things. We don't act on material processes in the same way. We act on the fears, the ideas, the drives, the desires, um, the idea, the, the, the Zizekian idea of a kind of invisible ideology there made up conceptually, which we, some, some that we know we know, some that we know that we don't know, and some that we don't know we know. I wonder if I want to talk about anything else. I think maybe la I'll finish on the idea of where does this leave us? Because a decentering of the subject is quite common. I think the idea of the tautology in the experience of objects is is really interesting more work can be done with that um but the question in a kind of speculative sense is um what's going to happen then to to the subject i mean another reason i like to think of the subject as neurotic is because we are gradually ridding ourselves of the humanist moral um aspects of a subject and what we are left with is still the possibility to comply to desire and these are the negative aspects of agency capitalism uses them very well um, capitalism uses the subject because in por pawns in a game because it knows that it will comply so we're left with a kind of whirlwind of a whirlwind of kind of zombie like beings where we need to have thoughts for capitalism to tap into and orient the way we go but we've lost mo most of the kind of hard drive of the subject so the neurotic subject is, is teetering right on the edge there and the question is going to be are we going to reintroduce new agency through, for example, retaliation. So you could say, for example, people could start saying, look, we're, we've just become so ill now, um, so depressed, so neurotic, that it's just people want to kill themselves. People are just not productive in a society. And then the, the old human subject kind of wins and it's appropriated now as it's got to the threshold of what's making us ill. And in a sense, then the neurotic or the ill or ill subject. Also, you could see this in the outsider, the idea, the notion of the outsider, that those people, they are the last traces and they of, of, of that type of subject. And the final naysaying at the end that we've got, we've gone too far. The Dostoevsky's, the um, Camus, um, the Thais. Um, or there's going to be a complete subsumption of the subject through probably technological pragmatism. And we've got this kind of weird sci-fi like Gattaca state. I don't know if you've seen the film. It's not great, but it has a good metaphor that there's a kind of, kind of, um, impersonal communism where people just have their place certain older ideas of feelings authenticities desires are kind of um, oppressed or suppressed depending on how you look at it um and who knows i think nick land has some interesting things to say about the future of what that type of subject would be if it's a subject so at the moment i'm beginning to think of the neurotic as exactly that threshold thought where nothing is left but the capacity to act on, to, to act as an object within capitalism. And we haven't quite got to the point where we realise this. It's the kind of the critique of the neoliberal subject.
and I'll do another another one of these next week or in two weeks time to tell you some more thoughts. Thank you.